Today we're joined by Paul Pollock, a former Fleet Marine Force Corpsman of the Navy who deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan and taught TCCC and Combat Lifesavers to hundreds of Marines while maintaining his primary duties in his platoon. He currently serves as an EMS Critical Care Paramedic District Chief and is a deputy under the Special Operations Division for his Sheriff's Office. Paul is also the medical instructor for Bear Solutions, where he teaches classes for civilians, military, and law enforcement. All right, so Paul, by now most people have seen your face on our channel, especially uh, you know after you save the day while Josh was, you know, making a tiny medical situation a hundred times worse. Uh, but when we were in the middle of filming that and all just laughing the whole time, you made the comment, believe it or not, guys, that's not the worst thing I've ever seen. Yeah, it's so, um... so I, it made me think like, okay, we got to get one of these stories. <laughs> so do you have one in mind? Well, it was like I was telling you, like a lot of my stories that I think are good can sometimes be perceived as like dark or just like, what, what are you talking about, Paul? But I will say like dealing with in, intoxicated people or, or drug overdoses, right? So with drug overdoses, um, there was a time period where I don't know where people were Googling this, but it was involving like waking up people that were overdosing on opioids with like copious amounts of ice. Now the ice would be either placed externally around the groin, and it's always a guy, externally around the groin or internally through a rectum. Um, like the, med like, the use of the medical term. <laughs> yeah, like, like, like a medical ice dispenser, or like a human ice dispenser almost, you know? <laughs> but I remember one time, I'll never forget it, and it was in a part of the, the district where it's very infamous that this stuff happened. And I was with a partner of mine that He's probably still one of my favorite people in the world. And his nickname is uh, Meat, but he's just a ride or die dude. But I remember it was me and him, and in this part of the, the district is kind of people, you can talk to them differently. Like, you know, it's, they're a little, a little bit more rough around the edges, you know. So we're talking to him, and we're trying to get this story. And this, this guy's starting to wake up, and he just starts screaming like, you know, my dick, my dick. And we're just like what yes you you're it's fine like you're okay we believe you had a, a drug overdose like did you take anything oh no 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 but my you know blah blah so we're like what's going on so we move them over and as we move them over we can actually hear like like kind of like this kind of like that ice cube kind of thing we're just like what is he's got basketball shorts on and you know sure sure yeah it was his he had like basically a cooler like an ice cooler around it and his is groin and it was extremely painful and like we had to like basically like de pants him and like remove all the ice you know and, and it was just it was a mess you know and he was more you know obviously he's more concerned about that he didn't care about overdosing but um but yeah i mean those, those are kind of the the goofy things that we see and then of course you know we see the the unfortunate pieces of the, that, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get the sense the more stuff that you see, the more that that starts to feel like, I don't want to say a norm, Yeah. but it probably takes even weirder, wilder stuff for you to be like, well, oh, okay, that's, that, that one was strange. Yeah. The, the, the neurological calls, like one of my favorite ones, I can't believe I didn't think about this was, uh, so amnesia, right? So stroke patients typically will present very confused right? Maybe some facial uh, droopage or slurred speech. But I was on, we were in route to the call or we have a computer that has like CAD notes. And I have a picture of it still to this day. But the CAD notes stated like, you know, it's like a sample history. It was like, you know, patient uh, states he does not remember anything. Patient is in the bedroom with his wife. Be advised, patient's wife states that they just had sex. And we're like, what? So like, this is post, like, intercourse and now he just doesn't remember anything yeah. so we go in there and we start talking this dude is like full-blown hey what's your name and he'd be like taylor swift hash browns you know just like craziness and you're just like but you could tell he's getting frustrated and it was one of those kind of funny moments i've seen something like this before so i was like oh this is trans global amnesia and the person i was with was like are you making this up like like i was like no no trust me it's, it's not a stroke it's trans global amnesia because i've seen this before and they think I'm just complete full of crap, you know, because it's just like very like, very just like, yep, this is it. You know, and I even, I told the wife, I was like, he's stable, everything's fine. I think this is what's going on. We get up to the, the stroke facility and the doctor shows up and he's the basic neuro doc with a bow tie and glasses. You know, he's just like, oh, hello, sir. 
And uh, he comes out, he's like, yes, yeah, transglobal amnesia. I was like, boom, gotcha. Like, I need to be a neurosurgeon. Like, this is it, this is my calling. But yeah, it, I just got lucky. But yeah, it's just stuff like that, the quirkiness, you know, and it's just, yeah, you, you get little peeks into people's kind of lives, man. And, you know, whether it was the military side or the pre hospital side, it's, it's very weird. Yeah. It's very weird. But yes, it, it does get very, you get kind of callous to, coming into people's homes and you got to make sure that you're communicating right with people because sometimes you know you'll catch yourself in a situation where you just want to laugh or you just want to kind of ask them like what were you thinking you know but you're like well that's not professional like I just need to like no judgment here right there's no judgment (laughs) (laughs) just here to do a job but yeah it can be so you mentioned military. What? Let's go even further back. What was what was life growing up like? Did you know that you wanted to at least be in the medical field of some kind, or were you just like, no, it's going to be military, and then you ended up with one of those MOSs? Yeah. So I I was a typical '90s kid. My parents were divorced. Um, my dad. I lived with my dad. My dad. Did you ever watch that '70s show? Mm-hmm, yeah. So my dad's nickname by all my friends was like Bad Brad, Super Dad, but he was very like foreman, like. You know, kind of like, hey, dumbass, you know, like, and, and like I was talking about the video earlier, it was like my dad had that saying, he's like, you know, don't do things half-assed, do it right the first time. So I grew up very structured, like gardening, like chores, lots of chores, you know. You weren't going to go hang out with your friends unless chores were done. So when I went in the military, it was like, it was like being at home. But when I went and saw my mom, my mom was very creative and free-spirited, and uh, I was enabled, enabled to like kind of, you want to watch Predator, you're eight years old, like, let's watch Predator, you know? And that was, like, quickly one of my favorite movies, like, Predator's, like, top number one, like, Commando, and the cliche 90s movies. And she would, uh, she would kind of enable that by, like, putting me in T-shirts and cutting holes, putting nail polish. I had a a M240, like, belt-fed toy machine gun that was neon orange the belt, like the top cover opened and like you could change spade grips and even had like a, uh, it didn't have a, 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 oh my gosh, I'm going blank here. Um, Thinking leash. You're talking about sling? Sling, thank you. God bless, it's been a long day. Yeah, I didn't have a sling, so she like made me a sling out of like a tie. And then like the, the belt actually, when you pulled the trigger, it would rotate. Oh, it's awesome. So, like, I would, like, and I had a, uh, watching Bad Boys growing up, I had, like, a M240, or I'm sorry, M, uh, a Beretta M9 that had, like, a reciprocating slide, and you could take the mag. So, I'd be, like, running through the woods, just, like, you know, I, that was me as a kid, and even in Boy Scouts and stuff, like, when you were young enough, you go camping, we well, you find sticks, you know, so we were always playing a war, and um, I was always interested in kind of being in the Boy Scouts and becoming Eagle Scouts and doing things like that. I was kind of always geared towards it. Things didn't change. I'm a typical 2000s guy where 9-11 occurred and that still really didn't do anything for me because I was in eighth grade. I was just kind of like, man, this is really bad. But I remember in 2004, I was a junior in high school and I was sitting in class watching the Marines take Fallujah again, Operation Mastro, or I'm sorry, Operation Fan and Fury. And I'm watching that, and I'm like, man, I want to do that. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you even do that? Outside of no, we had recruiters coming to school all the time. So I realized that like I didn't want to go to college. The only thing that I was thinking about with college was like nursing, and that didn't sound fun. And whenever I grew up watching like the war movies, I always kind of really gravitated towards like the medic. Mm-hmm. You know? So I remember going to the Marine recruiter. Well, backtrack. I went, my dad was in the Navy. And he was like, look, dude, you need to go talk to the Air Force. Like, trust me. Like, Air Force is like, you're going to eat well, you're going to get treated right, you're going to have really nice barracks, like, everything's going to be nice. So I was like, cool, let's do it. Well, I'm too dumb to be in the Air Force. I took an ASVAB. He was, he, they pitched me, like, at the time, I didn't know what it was. It was like pararescue jumper. I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. And I, I, I'm not a test taker. I just didn't care. And I was like, yeah, let me take your stupid ASVAB. I already did this once. And I took it, and he was like, well, you can join the Air Force, but we're not going to guarantee you a job. So I was like, eh, I don't like that. I'm not signing a contract not knowing my future. So when I went to the Marine Corps recruiter, they were like, well, we don't have medics. We have corpsmen. You got to join the Navy. And I was like, well, my dad was in the Navy. A lot of my uh, people that I knew growing up were in the Navy. 
And I was like, yeah, sounds good. So I joined the Navy, uh, went through all that pipeline to eventually become an 8404, what they call a Fleet Marine Force Corpsman. And I served with my entire career with 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines. So I, I was uh, very fortunate. I had a really, I tell people it was the best, worst times of my life. I was able to deploy uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan. I had really good, really good platoon, really outstanding mentorship. There were some, not only Marines, but senior corpsmen that took a lot of time, love, and energy into me and really kind of molded who I am. And it just kind of helped me out. So, yeah. So, I, yeah, that was kind of my path into the military. Gotcha. What do you think shaped, uh, I mean, obviously being in the military and having the MOS that you did and the experiences that you did um, preset kind of the, the path and landed you where you're at today. But inside of that, are there any specific things or individuals or experiences that now looking back on, you're like, man, if, if that didn't happen, I probably still wouldn't have ended up here. If that person hadn't intervened, yeah. are there any things that stand out in your time in? Yeah. So like one of the first things that I did when I, so I, I had a really cool like pathway, like I got to go work at officer candidate school in uh, Quantico, Virginia, while I was waiting to class up with, with at the time they call it Fleet Marine Training Battalion or Fleet Marine Service School, um, which was like my introduction to Marine Corps. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So basically go to boot camp again. Um, but I got to hang out with these individuals and see like the professionalism of kind of like what the, the Marine Corps is. It was interesting because it was very high and tight, intense, like a, not appearance-based, but the traditions and standards. So you're really hit with that. Um, but when I got to my unit, I remember checking in because they were, we were at 29 Palms, we were about to deploy. So like the way that we were doing things back then is you do, you deploy, you come back, you do pre deployment workup and then you deploy. And that's just the cycle that we were going on. Um, so I, I ended up coming in about a week and a half into their, their training exercise at 29 Palms. And I remember meeting my, my senior line corpsman. And I was like, Hey man, like, I really want to do good at this. Like. What's your advice? And if you guys have seen Gen Generation Kill. Oh, I yes. love You know when the reporter too. shows up and they're like, there's your, you know, they like, it's like the rack and they're just like, there's your shit. Yeah. 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 That's how it is, man. Like you show up, you're a new guy. They're like, everybody's kind of trying to fill you out. Like, yeah, you get thrown like, yeah, go sit over there. We'll tell you like when we need you. Yeah. So I asked him, I said, well, you know, what do I do? And he was like, man, they need to, be, if you can be a Band-Aid slinger and sit on the truck, no one's going to, they're not going to respect you the same. You need to be able to do exactly what they do. You're not going to do it better than them. It's just, it ain't going to happen. You can try though. And you can really engage with them and learn everybody's role in that platoon. And then guess what? You are going to be the one teaching all the med stuff. And it was like, I'm like 18, 19 years old, man. Like most of these guys are deployed. Like I don't know anything about combat medicine so it doesn't matter so they're going to still look at you they're going to ask you questions so that really stuck out with me i still remember the first class i ever did and i just bombed it it was horrible I mean, it <laughs> what was, was so bad about it we were at 29 palms and and he was right he was like when you're teaching you're gonna always i still have the book today you're gonna need to figure out a training pro program or a training plan because they're not going to tell you like you're going to get like a really quick, you got 15 minutes, you're going to do a hip pocket and we need you to do, we need you to last this an hour. So he's like, you're going to have to have things in your back pocket. Cause they're going to ask you like, Hey, on the spot, like we need, we need a class and you're going to be like, Oh shit. So that, that happened. I'm sitting there in my rack. One of the corporals comes up to me and say, Hey man, we got about an hour to burn. I'm like you got a class you can give to the platoon. I'm like, yeah, of course. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And I'm thinking in my head, like, what am I going to teach these guys? <laughs> IVs, right? So like IVs, or everybody wants to know how to give an IV. It's the the very it's very common Saturday Sunday mornings. Everybody's in the barracks and they're hitting you up. Or, but on the on the practical side, I was like, man, like you know, typically you have one to two corpsmen per a platoon, and if I get sick, like they're gonna have to maybe start relying on me, and I can tell them what meds to give me. And uh, so I'm. I'm like thinking through and I'm in this and I got my little book. I'm writing my little POI. I'm like, okay, I've used the why, the equipment, like when and how, blah, blah, blah. 
Well, basically, everything that I've written down didn't go plot plan. It started off, I used a guy named, it was, it was one of the corporals, and very lean guy. Like, he could, like, flex, and it was just, like, veins. So I was like, yep, you're my guy. I've never done this before. I've started a bunch of IVs, and at this point in time, I'm probably a year and a half comfortable. Like, I've been in the military, and I finally get to my unit. It's probably about, actually about a year, about a year in. So I go, and I put the tourniquet on his arm, and I'm talking through, and of course, in typical military fashion, like we don't have small gauges, 14, 16, and 18, which are big, like big needles. So I'm like starting, I'm trying to talk and like time me initiating the stick. And then at one point in time, I even like stick him and like take it back out. And there's just like, just, and oh. I'm just like, oh no. And I'm just, I put it right back in. I get the cat while I blow it, you know, and, and it's just going horribly. And the corporal's just like, that's supposed to happen. And he's like looking at me and everybody's looking at me I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, totally, man. So I take it out and it's just swelling up and I'll put a bandaid and then I go over here and then I finally get it. And it's just, I mean, I got the 14 gauge in there and it's just bleeding everywhere because I'm not putting pressure. Uh-huh. And I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking, of, I'm freaking out because I'm like, great, like I am going to basically, they're not going to like me. They're going to hate me. And it just went horrible. Luckily, I was able to recover during that pre-deployment workup and like kind of come back and teach some classes and stuff like that. People were like, all right, maybe, maybe he's all right, you know. But yeah, you know, then we deployed and everything was fine. But, uh, but yeah, people like, you know, I had a senior uh, chief, Chief Buck, and, you know, uh, had a H, uh, HM2 Schmall that was very instrumental in kind of teaching me how, how to organize things and how to communicate with people. And in the military, I think what I learned the most is relationships. Like the way you treat people, so your reputation is built off like a level of respect that you initiate within uh, like community or you know you know your presence how you talk you know how you teach you know how you can kind of get people to listen to you and that's really hard because i mean i'm telling you like you're, you're up in front of these guys that you know your introduction is like you know tell us something about yourself and you start talking and start throwing you know like shut up you know it's just <laughs> like you know, you're like i gotta make this interesting so it's really important and those kind of aspects the planning um all that was a really big deal now, I didn't give me any certs. So when I got out of the military, I had to start back all over and go through basically everything all over again, get where I'm at now. But the life experiences and the confidence was huge. What What was it that gave you so much confidence? By the time By the time you got out of the military, what was it that you did or what were some of the things that happened that yeah. gave you that sense of confidence? I think like, well, you talk to a lot of guys that deploy, you know, um, Deploying is a big kind of, you join the military because you want to do that. Like I, we all enlisted because, you know, and probably, you know, people don't understand, like you didn't just get to deploy. Like you, you know, for our platoon, like there was a roster and it wasn't like some strain or strenuous like assessment. But during that pre-deployment workout, people were watching you. Like, can we trust you? Are you good at what you do? Um, are you going to listen to what we need you to do? And, you know, you kind of get, if you don't make that roster, you get shoved out of platoon and you get sent to like H and S, which is like support. Nobody wants to do that. And so that was kind of always my drive. So like, there's always, you know, being able to practice not only medicine in austere environments, but be a part of some of the, the situations that we were in overseas was always a really big confidence booster. Cause it's like, I got in the military when I was 25 years old and I probably had more life experiences at that time than some people at 35, you know, and, and it's just, just sometimes that's where the cookie crumbles. Um, but there's a lot of things that we were able to be a part of that I was really kind of proud of. Um, very fortunate that any, any of my friends that I had to treat all lived. Um, and then, you know, treating local nationals and stuff like that was kind of, there was an emotional attachment, but it was unfortunate. You didn't really get the feedback. You didn't know like what happened after. Like you'd just be like, "Well, I hope they make it." Like <laughs> so. But I think that right there is a big. You, you, you know, as a young man in the military, you have all these responsibilities, and you are literally, you know, one of our patrol bases was 100 by 100. The only thing separating us from the world was a little six foot burn. 
you know, and you, you know, you're, you're kind of inserted in this very uncomfortable world that you're just, you're so young, you're kind of ignorant to it. You're just like, you know, we can take on the world, you know. But, you know, when you're done, you're like, you know, especially when you get older, I started talking to some of my friends that we deploy with. I'm like, you ever think how crazy that was? Like, like I, I couldn't even drink yet, but I was like in Iraq. Like, that's weird, you know, and I was doing all this stuff and I had all these responsibilities. Like, that's super strange. But, yeah, stuff like that really did. It kind of boosted me up a little bit, I think. We stay so busy making these videos, to be honest. We rarely have time to fix lunch for ourselves in the middle of the day. And you end up having to eat stuff like a whole jar of peanut butter. Did you have, did you have that whole jar of peanut butter? Just about, and I'm starting to feel it. Yeah, for sure. If you're going to be eating a whole jar of peanut butter like that, you may get big like Paul, but you're going to have some regrets down the road as well. So, hear me out. If you are trying to stay fit this summer, whether you are trying to gain good weight or lose weight, check out factormeals.com. They ship food that's never been frozen directly to your door, and it is calorie conscious, and it is prepped for you. You're able to go in and hand select exactly what it is that you want to eat with your goals in mind. It saves you time and gets you back out the door to lift, to go dry fire, shoot, whatever it is that you're trying to do. So, we also happen to have a discount code. It is DC50. So go to factormeals.com slash DC50 and use the code DC50 when you check out to save 50%. This was a mistake. All right, I'll get you some more good right now. What were some of the things that you're most, like you look, font, you look back on fondly like the most the things you're most proud of well it's easy to say the med stuff um i know so it's kind of cool and i'm not gonna say his name but like i know one of the guys uh that we treated post ied blast uh, his dream was always to be a fighter pilot and uh he was a corpsman and he was uh, at the time he was an hm3 which is a third class player officer it was funny because like he he just survived this blast and he wasn't like morally injured, but he, him and it, it was a lot of, we ended up medevacing a bunch of dudes and um, long story short, like by the time I got to him, he, uh, I started, you know, assessing him and cutting him. And it's so funny cause like he's all amped up and peppered with all this shrapnel. And the first thing he asked me, he's like, is my tattoo okay? <laughs> I was like, yes. I was like, your tattoo's fine, man. I'm about to give you some morphine. Just relax, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we, we get him on the bird. Well, long story short, like, he ended up, now he is still active duty. He's an F-18 fighter pilot. Awesome. Wow. So, like, he's like this, you know, prior HM2 Purple Heart recipient, like, just just stellar dude. And he's, like, literally flying eight F-18s. So stuff like that, like seeing people be successful. Um, unfortunately, there, there's some sadder stories with that where some of the guys that we, uh, you know, kind of treated um, had traumatic brain, traumatic brain injuries were something that we weren't really super cognitive of, or we weren't aware necessarily at the time. And uh, some of those guys were affected a little bit more. But I think stuff like that, like seeing people, veterans do a horrible job keeping in touch with each other. I try to social media. I still have the same phone number I did in Hawaii, just because I've had people like randomly call me. It's weird, and uh, yeah, I mean, I just you just try to reach out, and you know, it, it, but you know, at the end of the day, like we don't communicate well with each other either. But when I do find out, like I hear somebody like that's doing well, or so uh, one of my buddies just moved here to Tennessee that I deployed with, and he's you know, he's doing very well in the medical community. So one of the guys uh, from another company, um, I won't name his name, but he just finished med school. He's, a, he's like a doctor. You wow. Know? And he had a, he had a hard deployment. And uh, so those things like there, that, that I think being a part of those traditions and that community and it's just massive. Yeah. yeah. But I'm a firm believer in like, I could sit here and all that stuff's cool, you know, but like, it's like, it doesn't end there. Like I'm, I'm more focused on like what I can do in the future. Cause you know, I got like, if you look at, I got about 20 years left to work, you know, like, I'm <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of one of those things where I try not to like, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm very fortunate in my military career. I'm very fortunate. Uh, best worst times of my life. And sometimes I'll have people ask me, like, you ever think of it? Like, cause I, 2026 would, would be my 20 year mark. I'd be retired. And my goal was to stay in the military. I met my wife right before I left. 
and we dated off and on the whole time. And in 2011, we got married and that was my decision. I was like, you know, do I want to continue down this path and, you know, do I want family or do I want the military? And I made the choice to get out to start a family and I have, and I'm very, I'm, I'm actually probably more proud of that in a way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a big deal. It's, it's a hard one. And then of course, you know, when I got out, like things changed drastically. So both yeah. like professional, I mean, you mentioned <laughs> that when things changed drastically, you, you mentioned that you had to restart, like you didn't pull any of those certs that you had from the military. So no, I had no certs as far as like, what did you do as professionally? Well, I struggled for a while it, transitioning out. And then of course it took me a very long time to talk to people about some of the things that a lot of guys struggle with. Um, but yeah, I started over. Like I didn't have an EMT cert. And when I got out, I remember coming back to Tennessee and I was in a gym working out and I had a, I had one of my shirts on from the military and, and a Marine came up to me who ended up being a deputy. And he was like, Hey, you still active duty? I was like, no. He's like, are you in the guard? I was like, no, I'm not, so I'm not doing that. And uh, he said, well, he's like, you ever thought about being a cop? I was like, yeah. I was like, I don't really know what I'm gonna do. And he's like, well, here's the process. And he explained the process to me. I was like, man, I really like need a job now. And like, I was like, I'm going to EMT school right now just cause that's what I know. He's like, well, let me introduce you to some, some of my Marine Corps and Army guys that work in this EMS. And I was like, what's EMS? He's like, it's emergency medical services. And he kind of laughed at me. And I was like, I don't know what that is, man. Like, you know, <laughs> and he introduces me and I put an app in. I ended up going through the interview process. And that was, that was about 11 years ago to this day. And yeah, now I'm a critical care paramedic district chief for uh, the department I work for. And yeah, I serve on the sheriff's office as, as a TAC medic and under the special ops division. So it's relationships, man. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's, it's huge. But it was a very long, the military helped kind of people know about what you do and how you do things, but it's not like I had a, like I was a TCCC instructor before there was a committee on TCCC. <laughs> so I remember being, uh, it was like the Navy and Marine Corps had their own TCCC schoolhouse. So I remember coming to my department and be like, hey, you guys ever thought about like this whole TCCC thing for like you know, active shooter? And they were like, yeah, do you have like a cert? I was like, yeah, I'm in like an instructor. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like, do you have like, basically you had to have like keys to NAMT to, you had to go meet a guy under a bridge and like talk to him and like go find him and be like, hey man, like, can you give me the, grant me permission to teach this? And it was like this really hard thing to obtain. And it was, it was crazy because when we finally got it, um, it was really nice to be able to kind of use those skills I learned in the military because it's all transitional or transferable. But yeah, it was, it was it was really hard. I'm really surprised. So in a lot of in a lot of professions, a lot of professionals in their field or masters in their field mm -hmm. who have done so like privately, like take uh, take movie directors for example. Yeah. A lot of the best movie directors they never went to film school. Correct. But film schools will hire them now to teach master classes or to teach yeah. courses, and they get honorary doctorates. Right? right. They basically get all the titles, all the certs. Um, to do that job, and that's kind of part of it. Like, we can hire you, but you have to have these these certs. Right. We're going to give them to you because we know you've mastered the content. Right. Is there no? Is there no? Is it there is nothing better. like that? It's better now. Like when you get through the schoolhouse, now you're automatically at EMTB, yeah. but you you can challenge the paramedic cert, like the national registry. But to go back to that, like I was an EMT, so like the rank is like EMT paramedic and then critical care paramedic. As an EMT, I was teaching critical care paramedics how to do like surgical crikes and like finger thoracostomies, which is like a surgical procedure to relieve like pressure and blood and stuff like that. With C -c -c combo or, or like, you know, darting people because like it was funny because like when I was active duty, I couldn't read. We didn't do we didn't do like 12 leads and like EKGs. I didn't care. Like we're all military age male. Like I'm not worried about you going in atrial fibrillation or, you know, we weren't doing CPR on people because, you know, if they die, they died because it was trauma. Um, so I didn't know anything about that really, but I, I could teach you how to do like all this crazy, like, you know, bandaging and junctional hemorrhaging. And it was kind of weird because I was qualified to, I knew how to teach it. I knew what I was talking about, but I wasn't a paramedic or a critical care paramedic yet. Like I'm just, 
an EMT punk kid that, you know, has had tattoos and cusses a lot, maybe, you know, I don't know, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is one of those things where, it, yeah, I mean, it, you had all these life experiences and you had all these capabilities to share knowledge, but your resume was like military EMT school. And it's just kind of like, you can put your schools in there, but when you're going to jobs, like that's one of the things they tell you when you get out. It's like, guess what guys, you're, you're a dime a dozen, man. Everybody's got these schools. You put like your little leadership school in there. It's not that nobody cares, it's just. Everyone else has it. It's white yeah, noise. Yeah, it, it's like when I'm, I'm getting my degree now, I'm, I'm a part of the National Leadership Society. And I did that because it was a national leadership society. And I, and I just basically took some seminars and stuff like that. But it was able to kind of like, oh, wow, like he's taking some time to do that. But it's, 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 it's really weird. The military is a wonderful experience. I don't recommend the people always be like, you recommend it for No, I don't. Because it's, as my dad would say, I'm the most rebellious rule follower ever me. Like, I will ask why. And I expect people to ask me why. But if you can't explain the why to me, like I don't really, it's not that I don't respect you, it's just I'm, just, I'm probably, I'm not gonna take a class from you. I'm not gonna listen to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't, you can't explain it to me. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the bummer about the military, unfortunately. Were you able to secure a job right after getting your EMT or were, did you fall into something else before you? I got you... really lucky. I got really lucky. I, I got done with school and before I got done with school, I got to interview immediately like basically I, I got hired part-time and at the time like I was very fresh out and the money was running out and I got hired part-time and in, through my hiring process of PR in person somebody had quit and they're like hey you, you did really well like do you want to work full-time I was like yes <laughs> but to break it down this way like my first year as an EMT I made like less than thirty thousand dollars and what year was this this is 2011 oh yeah that's I mean that's a little bit more than minimum wage. Oh, 100%. And I remember thinking to myself, like, this ain't gonna work, man. Like, so I, I was like, should I go law enforcement? Like, now that I have this job, but do I need to go to the academy for 12? Like, can I afford to do that? Like, it's a big, uh, it's a big stretch, and they don't really tell you how to deal with that when you get out. Um, but I mean, it's just, it's relationships. I just really tried to focus on making sure I treated everybody with respect and really, I really kind of seeked out. There were some people at my department that uh, mentored me, put a lot of time, love, and energy. It's just throughout my life, I've always met people either at my department or, or you know, Drew from, from Bear, like mentorship. Like, there's a lot of people like that out there that if you seek it and put the equal amount of time, love, and energy into, it's just what you get out of it. Hmm. Do you catch yourself now becoming that same mentor in other people's lives? Yeah, it's, it sounds cheesy. I try to. Um, so I eventually became like a field training officer. I do a lot of training at my law enforcement agency with firearms tactics and med. Um, I try to, when I instruct or give people any sort of advice or something like that I keep it very kind of it's like the Ron Swanson approach like I'll answer your question with a question because I want you to feel confident in the answer like I'm going to give you the fundamentals like the principles and guidelines on like what I know and what I know works whether it's evidence-based medicine or you know backed by proven tactics um, I'm not I hate it when people use just experience like my, and I always tell people before we start a class, like my experience alone does not back why I'm teaching what I'm teaching. Because guess what? There's always somebody that's done something cooler. That's done, like there's always Kyle Lamb, right? Like <laughs> there's gonna be a Kyle Lamb that comes up and it's just like, well, I don't really have his experience. Yeah. You know? yeah. But, but you know, it's, it, I'm using these principles and guidelines and, and it, it's, it's very important. And I find like with mentorship, I don't have the answers for you but I can, I can give you some guidance. Um, and that's what people did for me. And, and really it comes down to, too, like the things I learned in the military, uh, especially with teaching or uh, from leadership, I just try to give people the tools. And if you don't do anything with that, I'm not gonna do it for you. But I've had people where 
they put a lot of time into it. And, and they, and I, I feel like they've done some really good things. And, and that right there is, makes me feel old. <laughs> you know, it yeah. makes me feel really old. Once you hit a certain age, you, you, you have to feel old. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. It's weird though, because you will get phone calls. You know, people will be like, hey man, what you said, like that worked. Or hey, you know, I presented a, you know, this proposal and it went down pretty good. I'm like, good. Like, I'm glad, you know, like, but I don't, like, I always tell them, I don't have the answers. I really don't. But I will try to find out how to get you in the right direction. So seems yeah, like, you're right. It seems like in, I would assume the medical community as well as the firearm community, there's all these communities that people yeah. want to be plugged into. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but the idea that I so badly, whoever this person is, want to be in the community, but they're not necessarily willing to work Correct. to become valuable inside of that community themselves. And they may be already plugged in and have a group, but they're not offering information to others to build up the community around them. They just want to play with yeah. whoever they want to be around and at least have the notoriety. And at one, at one phase of my life, I absolutely was that way. Correct. I just wanted to be in with the cool guys, but wasn't necessarily willing to put the work in. I did eventually figure that out. Yeah. And and then once I actually got to, you know, a point where it's like, I actually can shoot a pistol or a rifle to a point where I can be around other people that shoot well. Right. Having the the head knowledge to be like, yeah, man, but someone else encouraged me and got me to this point. Estel for us yeah. agreed. Like he's someone else who who helped get me to where I'm at in small ways that turned out to be like ripple effects. Mm-hmm but then there's the responsibility to turn around and bless those people as well. Yeah, you pretty much answered it. I mean, honestly, like, you know, um, I'm a firm believer you ain't got a lot to kick it. Like, you know, I am not, I wasn't a part of JSOC. I was not a a cool guy. Um, I had a lot of opportunities during the time I was in with like live tissue labs. Um, A funny story about that is like, you know, the community right yeah they they do they do stupid stuff too like so i remember one time i was seeing a live tissue lab it was a pj a force recon or at the at, we call him sarks now he's a force recon corpsman uh a pararescue jumper or, i'm sorry it's two pjs force recon and a navy seal and this navy seal guy i can't remember his name i, I want to say it was like brody you know he had beautiful i'm sure it was brody. beautiful blonde hair just jacked, you know, and but we're about to do this live tissue lab. If you don't know anything about live tissue labs, they don't really do them that much anymore, but we're using basically like luau pigs. And they would sit, they, we would have veterinarians there and they sedate them and then and basically we'd practice messing up. Well, long story short, like we go out there and, you know, they drag this pig out and the, the whole thing is to show cavitation, right? So you have different skill stations in basically providing advanced uh, trauma resuscitation. And it's funny, you know, he's out there and basically, you know, they're standing over this pig, you know, the force recon guy's just talking smack. He's just like, don't miss, don't miss. And he's just like, you know, he shoots and, you know, he's like this and and he misses the pig. And it was just immediate, like you could tell, just like, and we're all like, you know, us, like these, you know, general population infantry guys are just like, yeah, like how's he joke. missing? But you know, it's it's just like stuff like that happens. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, there is a. I think people, it's the same thing like being in the military. You're so eager in proving yourself. Like, I want to go. I want to get in firefights. I want to get. I want to go to combat. Like, when do I get to go to Fallujah? Like, when do I have my Ramadi? You know, when do I do this? And it it's unfortunate, but it takes. You know, I deal with it now. A lot of like you know officers or or EMS guys were just like, you know, I want to just know everything. And it's like, look, man, like that comes with time. And I've been doing this since 2006 and I don't know everything. Um, and you're still figuring it out. Like just be patient. If you do something long enough, like you're involved in like a community or something, you're going to see things, you know? Now I will say what helps is the confidence instilled through competency and proficiency, which I'd say a lot of times, but it's, it's, it's legitimate training. Um, that helps out a lot, but yeah, I think people get so fixated on having like this, like, I want to be able to say in my profile that I'm like mm-hmm. tact medic extraordinaire. Like you see in the med community, you'll see people be like Paul Pollock, district chief, CCPM, TCPP, 
blah, blah, blah. And it'd be all these little acronyms. And it's just like, no, who, I don't even know what muscles mean, man. Like, the F, you know, all this stuff, you know. And, and, and sometimes I get why we do that. Um, but everyone's in a rush to just be like, I want to be a part of, like, like the root soul. Like, I want to be a part of this community. And I want to be around, like, really cool people. And that's kind of it's, it's a good thing. Cause it kind of drives you like, I'll tell you straight up. Like I shoot with people. I like shooting with people that are better than me because I always feel like I suck, you know, but like if you stay in, it's like that small fish, big or big fish, little pond kind of thing. It's really easy to get complacent, stay in that kind of little area where all of a sudden, like, you know, you're just hot shit all the time. The problem is it feels good. It feels great. Yeah. It's, a, it's a huge ego boost. Yeah. Right. And then you go outside that circle. Maybe you go to a class or whether it's med or tactics or, you know, um, like I serve on a part-time team, you know, uh, under the special ops division for the, the sheriff's office. And man, you go meet people, with these full-time teams, you ain't nothing. Like, you know, I have a really good buddy of mine that uh, went out to California, LASAB, which or SEB, which is LA Special Enforcement Bureau. They are like by far the coolest special, like they tack med, like, all the cool, sexy stuff, like going and doing rescues out of hoists and, you know, oh, cool. you know, like, you know, like, you know, how California is or like you got somebody that rolled a vehicle like a, like a mile down a hill. And, like they're just down there just like, we're here to save you, you yeah. know? Yeah. You got people like that, you know, and my buddy went out there and he was, I was like, what was it like? He's like, do they have a great gym? And I, I he's like, I kind of felt stupid because I asked him, he's like, so what's like a slow day like? And they're like, they just kind of like, <laughs> like, dude. We're either like running warrants or we're doing rescues or like there's no slow day. Like we get an hour to PT, the rest of the day is go time. And uh, and you, you meet people like that or like, yeah, I guess I'll go back to my little pond over here and, you know, <laughs> kind of be a big fish. But it is, it's really easy. Like you said, it feels good. Um, you know, it's like shooting. Everybody, rifle, right? You go to a rifle class and everybody's shooting at three yards, you know, and it's like, like, because I want you fast. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, let's take that out to 50, 75, or 100. And then everything changes. Same thing with pistol. Yeah. You know? Well, and then follows the justification as to why I missed. Or then Correct. The, yes. the, well, I didn't know yes. that because, or I used to be able to yeah. do that, or whatever. Yeah, it's even pistol. Like, you know, everybody want, it, at one point in time, was, was it the draw? Like, oh, you know, sub second draw. Yeah, sub second draw, right? Oh, yeah. No it's no like, cool, man. Like, what can you do at 25 yards on a B8 target? Yeah. Oh, well, I would never shoot a target at 25 yards. I'm like, okay, well, maybe, but like, what about the fundamental? Like, we're not talking about scenarios here. We're talking about fundamentals and, yeah. Yeah. and stuff like that. You I know? love it because <laughs> I was always, I've always been good at like super long pistol shots. Yeah. Just because it was cheap and it was fun. Yeah. It's like you just take one shot at 100 yards. Oh, I miss. Okay, I'll devote yeah, but it's 10. at 100 yards. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so once you're able to do that Which consistently, yeah. it's like, oh, man, this is my thing. Mm -hmm. And then it's one-handed. But it is always, like, funny because um, you're right. You do feel for a moment that you've got this, like, superpower. And it's like a false sense of confidence, oh, yeah. right? And then you compare that to someone who, you know, is better or has just done it longer. And it's like, yeah, okay, I'm nothing. Yeah. Especially, like, I'll tell you straight up, like, when I'm teaching people, like, you know, it's different teaching people that you know are really squared away and they have experience. Because you'll go out there and, you know, you feel pretty good about things, but you're like, man, like, I am. Or even being on camera. Like that right there, like you are opening yourself into a whole world. You want to be a part of the community, right? Go videotape yourself doing some things and see how much of the community is going to be like, why are you doing that? Yeah, or, you that's, know. that's my favorite response. If someone if someone ever <laughs> explains, you yeah. did it wrong, here's how you should do yep. it. I love responding and saying, Thank and you. I don't do this all the time. I, I love saying, okay, but the other the other favorite one is, Totally appreciate the feedback, man. Do me a favor. Would you make a yeah. YouTube video or an Instagram video explaining and demonstrating everything that you're showing? <laughs> yes. Post yeah. it and tag me in it. And that way I can actually learn what you're trying to express. No one ever does no. that. No. It's the man in the arena. The guy who's actually like, I yes. will open myself up to criticism. A, and learn. I want to learn by creating this content. And B, I'm happy to share some of the slight little bit of information that I do have with yeah. those people who are still trying to work their way up and get there. Yep. And everyone just loves to sit behind the keyboard 
and and tell you what you did wrong. Well, that's that man, that Churchill's uh, like speech. That that's probably one of my favorite speeches right there. Um, I don't know about heart, but like every once in a while, if I want to get pumped up, I'll listen to that because it is like you know, you're right. Like when you're in the spotlight, and I, you know, when I, especially when we're teaching first responders, law enforcement, or fire and EMS, I always tell people like. Look, man, you are no more, you are 100% the man in the arena. Everybody is waiting to either applaud you or destroy you. And it's the same thing on the, the social media thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it you know, it, people want to be a part of the community. And the problem is, too, is there's a timeline to this. Like, how relevant are you with what you're putting out? Unfortunately, what I put out changes a lot. Like, the way, you know, I don't like, for example, like dropping knees pressure points we don't teach that anymore it's old school it's out of date it's actually been proven to cause more harm than good you're prolonging care um, there's a lot of data that shows that you know solve one problem at a time let's not overcomplicate this thing um, but you know you, you constantly get that feedback like well, hey man you know i took a class six years ago and this like high speed person told me that you know they do it this way hey cool outstanding like do you still have their contact? Like, are they still practicing? Like, do they still do the medicine part? You know, and um, and the reality is, is like in my space with like the med or even the tactics, there's no, there's no black and white. Like, there's a there's principles and guidelines. We're going to give you some things to really base off decision making, and I can tell you what's going to happen physiologically, <laughs> right? I can't tell you what the environment's going to dictate. Like how many, what's your resources? What do you got? Like, you know, what's the situation presented with in front of you? And that right there is where I think a lot of the, the community, you know, there's, you can't, it's just, it's tricky. It's yeah, really tricky. It is. I've, I've noticed, cause I mean, we've, I think pretty much all of us get these DMs or these comments yeah. like, Hey man, I'd love to do what you do. How do I get into that? Right? Yeah. How do I get into the gun industry? How do I do what you do? And it's really interesting because a couple times I've fired back like, well, what is it that you think I do? Yeah. Or what, what is it, what, what role do you think I have in the community? Like really put it back on them be like, have you, have you actually tried to dissect what it is yeah. that I do? And usually it comes back to, oh, well, I want to make cool videos. Correct. Right. And it's like, okay, there's nothing wrong with that. We, every, pretty much every single American watches some sort of TV show, goes and watches some kind of movie yep. or plays some kind of video game. We all want to do, Oh yeah. everyone is, is interested in media in some way. Oh, like, yeah. I get that. But then it's, then it's like, okay, so you want to make cool stuff and you want people to like your stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's a radically different motivator than I want to help people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can have both. But really, like putting it back on another person, like, what is it you really want to do? You want to make videos and you want people to enjoy it. You want to express mm -hmm. yourself creatively and that's what's going to make you happy. Awesome. Well, then start making videos. Oh, you want to help people. Right. That's what gets you going. You actually want to make a difference in people's lives. Well, you don't need the media part. Look around you. Yeah. Start helping people now where you're at, your friends, your family. And over time, if you're passionate enough about it, and if you pursue it hard enough, most people find a way to make a living doing it. Yeah. But it's like, it's, yeah. it's, it's always like what we do from the outside is uh, way more glamorous than what it actually is, you know, in well, practice. Even my life, like we have a, like a quote, it's like, you kind of deal with the nine and live for the 10, right? I get a lot of people will be like, how do I become a tax medic? And I, my, my first answer is, have you ever thought, do you have a passion for law enforcement? No, I just want to be like a TAC medic. And we're like, well, cool. Well, you need to have a passion. You, you need to learn how to be a cop. Mm -hmm. Because it's just like that, that, that what I do now is exactly what I did as a corpsman. Like, I take pride in being able to know the same roles that they do, just like I did with my platoon. Because guess what? If everything goes good, you're not doing any med. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's the goal here, right? Like, you you're here as a contingency but you're you're a contingency if it happens otherwise you're entry you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing 
you're supposed to know the guidelines, the, the legal, you know, the, the you know your Tennessee code ante, like everything you're allowed to do as as a law enforcement officer. And then on top of that, I always tell them too is like, so you want to be a tac medic? What have you done on the med side? Like no one ever like you know thinks about like all that stuff you did as a paramedic or as a critical care medic. It all translates, man. Like everybody just wants to you know go to EMT school get done with EMT school and then join an apartment and do all those cool guys like swift water. I get it too, a swift water. How do I become a swift water medic or a swift water tech? Um, and it's just like, well, you, you got to find a department, either join a fire department or join a law enforcement agency that has a special ops division. And you're going to put some time in. You're not just going to join the department and be like, Hey guys, I want to do all the cool stuff. <laughs> hey, that's cool, man. Like everybody else here, they want to do the cool stuff too. What do you, what do you got to offer? You know, and it's like, you know, and that was, and I will say that's the kind of beauty of the med side is it's like, well, Paul is a medic. Like we need, we need a medic, but we need a medic also that can like do both things. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, maybe he is cool. And then you go through, you know, I went through all the same assessments and selection as everybody else. And, um, you know, it's, it's, you can't, you can't just pull the little, well, I'm just a medic guys. I'm just here to like watch it doesn't work that way and i think a lot of people will kind of fail to recognize like that's not how it works man and, but they just want to i'm not saying they want to just take you know pictures and and all that but i don't think people really understand how much time and effort and you know i i i'm i'm like never home you know one of the best pieces of advice i got from a senior chief when i got out was like you gotta find balance balance between doing what you love and making the ones you love happy I ain't found that yet because I'm constantly in this community that is like, you know, 911, 911. And, and then on top of that, I enjoy helping people through education. So I love doing the things we do with Bear. Like that's like, it's, it's so much fun to go train other law enforcement officers or do open enrollments and meet these people that are super interested in like the med side, especially the trauma. Um, but, you know, on top of that, I, I still have a problem. You know, you talk about that balance. And I wonder if sometimes I wonder if that is we can get close to the balance. Yeah. But if that is a curse that yeah. men just have to deal with their entire lives. On one hand, you have um, and it's not like we even yeah. hate it. We actually in some ways thrive off of it. So oh, 100%. We, we were designed and created and biologically we want to get stuff done. Like mm -hmm. that's what, and, and if you're a guy and you don't like hard work, there's something, honestly, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, you, so you like, had a breakdown somewhere. Yes, exactly. There's something <laughs> that didn't happen yeah. right. So we want to accomplish things. At the same time, we want our trad wife and kids, right? Yeah. Uh, we want to have a good relationship with them. We also want to be masters yeah. at what we do and respected among our peers and surrounded by people who are equally as talented and hardworking as we are. And then you have, um, but you also want to be a good father and a good husband right. and put time towards that. But if you put too much time towards that, you start to fail at this. And if you fail at that, you don't put food in their mouths. Yeah. Well, and it's like, it's this, it is a vicious cycle. And, and I wonder... Is this an internal struggle? Like, well, is this, an, an, hold on, better better yet, is this a problem to be solved or is it a tension to be managed? Yes, agreed. In the same Genesis story, we learned that uh, we were made for work. Mm -hmm. We were made for a garden. And in the same story, it's not good for a man to be alone. Mm -hmm. Dang it. Those two yeah. feel like they contradict each other. And yeah, to Drew's Every point, day I go back and forth oh, yeah. between... I am sucking at my job and I'm sucking as a dad or like, oh, I did a great job today. And as a result of doing so well, yeah. And like, at the the, like, of like on this particular day, I carried the boat. Right. But yeah, you, someone gets cheated. I will tell you this, like, you know, it goes back to like, what's the downfall of most men is like treasure adventure and women. It ain't going to be women for me at all. Uh, it ain't gonna be treasure because I picked the wrong career field to get rich. Like, <laughs> you know, I was the, like when people ask me, like, you know, like how do I do what you did? I'll be like, look, man, I chose poorly. I chose like a career path that had everything to do with experiences and adventure. 
and it has not made me rich. I've been very grateful to have what I have. And I've also, like, I married my best friend. And man, like, there's been many times where it is like, okay, we got time out, figure this whole communication thing out. But you're right. Like, I think a lot of us get into this cycle of, you know, it's very, for me, it's very addictive to figure out how I can help people because that is like kind of my career path and uh, whether it's education or kind of the 911 side. And uh, yeah, it's very hard. And it's really strange too, you know, for example, like, you know, I just got an award at work for, uh, I, became, I got district chief of the year. I didn't see that one coming. Uh, I was very fortunate to have my family there to see that. And my family was very proud, but it also kind of like, my, my chief was given the award out. He was talking about like, kind of like, you know, he thanked my family for basically saying like, thank you for sacrificing your time so we can have time here. Man, like that is probably the hardest thing for us to do. And sometimes I feel like it, it comes off as it's a little easier for me to do. I will joke like my wife. So like if I have multiple days off in a row, she can like, I'm, I don't do good just sitting at home. Like I don't, I don't do good. So it's kind of like, hey, are you not like, my the joke is like you don't have a meeting today like you don't have like class to teach or like you need she knows you're dying and yeah. yes yeah <laughs> it's just like, cause lives I, too yeah it's very strange but I, I think it's just it's like this this trait i think the only thing you that that i have advice for people because people have asked me about this you know and i'm like man you're not alone and it's just like you got to figure out how to communicate not just with your family but with work too and um you know, it's, it's a, it's a, man, it's a struggle. It's a huge struggle. It, that was honestly, it's funny because I got out of the military because there's like a 99% divorce rate in my unit. Like, I was like, I don't want to be divorced. Like, I just got married. Like, like, yeah, like, am I going to just deploy forever and like, just do this, you know? And I knew the path a lot of my you know, older, older friends had went down. And I'm not saying that the military just, you know, ruins your family or anything like that. Cause there's a lot of people that pull that off successfully, but it's funny, I got out and I, I, I'm really doing the same thing. I just, I'm going on like little micro deployments all the time, traveling for training, traveling for work. And um, yeah, it's, it's hard. So I wanna go back to uh, something that you said where I can't remember the exact scenario, but someone is stating I wanna do the cool thing. Mm -hmm. The cool thing could be, I wanna marry the prettiest woman. I yeah. wanna go on the coolest deployment. I wanna join the coolest team. I want the best job in the world. And the answer to any one of those things is awesome. So does everyone else, what do you have to offer? Yeah. And the what do you have to offer really applies to all of those scenarios. Yeah. I wanna go work for that company. Fantastic. What are you bringing to the table? Yeah. I wanna get married to so-and-so. Right on, get in line. Yeah. What do you have to offer? What are some of those things in your career field? And you've mentioned like, yeah. well, okay, TACP. Uh, yeah. I, what is it that you actually want to be doing um, if you want to join any of what it is that you do? Let's yeah. say that there's a 16 year old kid who's like, I don't know if I want to join the military. I don't know if I just want to go work behind a, a, a you know, gun store desk and, and yeah. sling guns. What do I do? And maybe they don't end up in your exact same career path. But what are some things that you look back on and go, well, those things that I did absolutely benefited me in the long run? Well, I think, you know, so I, it, my reason why I do what I do, I don't live in the county I work in, but I live near it, right? But I, I live in the community and it kind of like, it branches over into where I live. So like, I guess I do live where I work. I just don't live in the, I can't say the county, but the county, I, it's all part of the same response system, right? I will put it this way. There is something to be said about, I can make a phone call and have information between a law enforcement, fire, EMS. I have been at work and had to call an ambulance to my house and <laughs> that's a big deal. And knowing that you train those people to make a difference in that. So, what I tell people is, you know, you're not gonna get rich, you're not gonna get any fame, you ain't gonna get any glory. Uh, when I was active duty, I was put in for wards. And my CO told, you know, my uh, 
the person that put me in was like, why are we giving an award for something we're supposed to do? I was like, hmm, yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I dig it, right? So when people ask me like, you know, like how do I get to that process? It, it, if you, if it's, if it's TACP, like the state of Tennessee doesn't have a great TACP program. I am very fortunate to work for a department that works very well, a sheriff's office that works very well with EMS agency, right? And it's just always had a good relationship. It's very rare, very rare. Most law enforcement agencies do not, they have basically EMTs trained in the police department that try to do that role. Some of them do it well, some of them try to do that role. So I just tell people, I was like, look man, like what's your end goal? And then you need to contact people. Like if you're gonna live in this area, figure out who's on this team or this department and figure out how they're successful. And it sucks because I don't have like a great like model for it because my success is due to relationships built and being able to like work hand in hand with a lot of people and you build up this mutual level of respect. And they're like, hey, yeah, Paul, Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. Like they, he can do this. And it's, it's huge, but being able to work in a system, like, like I said, where I know what's going on 24 seven and I have people that I rely on. That's why I stay where I'm at. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I never tried to go like federal, like actually I always want to go like federal law enforcement or go back into the military. I struggled with that heavily. Um, but I started quickly realizing like, man, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things as a man, when you start talking about family stuff, like being able to call on people to take care of your family when you're not there. Cause I'm not with them all the time, but I know the people that are protecting them and that are serving them. Well, I've had a hand in not only training them, but I've trained with them. So I know them like I, it's, it, it's really strange, but it, it's stuff like that, that, uh, I try to tell people is like, if you want to get in this job in the 911 service, whether it's fire, EMS, police, that's what you need to think about. Cause it, it is, I'm not gonna say it's like a brotherhood or anything like that. That's probably way overused. You'll probably make a very small amount of relationships that will, can be good or bad that are going to really help you out. And at the end of the day, just be a good dude. Always work hard. If there's a course, take the course. If there's a course that's not going to only benefit you, but benefit your department, take it and figure out what you can do to bring back to the department. So we've kind of already hit on your military experience, yeah. your law enforcement EMS experience. You're also training people through Bear Solutions. Right. What do those classes look like? Because I'll be honest, I've been aware of your name for years through Bear Solutions or maybe yeah. however long it's been that you- We've been in there, I've been with them about three, three and a half years. Okay, yeah, so probably about that. Um, but what do those classes even look like? Yeah. If someone were to sign up and take a class, are those law enforcement only? Are you guys yeah. teaching other military? Are you guys teach like, what is it that you guys do with the medic side of Bear Solutions? Yeah, so the medical apps, so there's a, there's an open enrollment med apps that's for responsible citizens, right? Law enforcement can take it, but we have like a, we have an LE only one. And the only difference between the two is the LE one in, in the military side is either military is gonna be TCCC based, LE is gonna be TECC based. And the resources that those people have compared to, you know, everyday individuals is completely different. Um, you know, so for, you know, we have a course coming up in September and we're really excited about that one. And it's the med applications, it's an open enrollment. Um, so there's a combination of understanding purpose of the process. So what we like to do is, is kind of focus on skills application evaluation. So, you know, you're gonna show up and we're gonna focus on skills, right? We're gonna get down into establishing a baseline on the big stuff. Tourniquets, bandaging, and, the, and those, those are the two big ones that people seem to, everybody wants to sit and let like I talk to you and then you feel good about it, but I'm gonna make you do it because it, it can be tricky. Um, and then as we progress, you know, it's a two day course, um, we progress into the why. Right, the application, understanding like phases of care, you know, like the right place and the right time to do something. Uh, it's not like active shooter based, but we do, uh, we do, it, it's a firearms class too. So we, it's not 100% scenario driven, but we kind of mix in with like the hostile, what I call hostile events, right? So, you know, most people that take the class are very geared towards concealed carry, which is great. Cause I mean, I think it's 
the United States of America. You carry a gun. You should be able to protect your family. Um, but what people don't also realize is like those bad things happen in those situations, you know. Um, so the the likelihood of you becoming injured can be increased very very quickly. Uh, the transferability of the the trauma skills that we teach in the class, well, you can take the gun out of it. You can take like the hostile event side out of it, and just you know you show up to a traumatic incident, and you're going to be way more confident than most people are. And there is no classroom. Like it's, we get out there and everything we do, we'll give you a point of instruction and then we're gonna put hands on and we're gonna drill and drill and drill. And we'll slowly start stacking things on there. You know, like for example, like barricades. Y'all have probably shot barricades thousands of times. You know, how many times have you shot a barricade and simulated going to rescue a family member, you know? You know, it, hardly ever. Yeah, and it's kind of one of those things where it's it's a little theatrical sometimes, where people are just like, do 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 do. You know, it's just like you know, okay, well, you know, we're we're shooting paper targets, right? We're trying to emotionally invest you into the situation, right? So when is the time to solve the med solution or the tactical solution? And and that's what we kind of talk about. We build that. You know, we'll start with barricades, and then it's like, well, let's talk about how to. Let's say your family member is is injured. When do you go rescue them? Do you rescue them? Can they talk to you? Can they come to you? Like, what are these little immediate action plans in these rehearsals that we're trying to establish to where you kind of don't get caught, you know, out in the wind and become part of the problem? There's another big piece of that where we really focus on, you know, your, we call it call to hire, like kind of notify 911. You're in plain clothes. You know, we, you know, you could use the gas station kind of robbery situation where, or, you know, ATM or whatever, you got your back turned and somebody comes up behind you and tries to mug you or something bad happens and you decide to employ that firearm. There's a lot of people calling and law enforcement doesn't always get like accurate, like, you know, hey, there's four white males in this room. Hey, there's a white male with a gun at the Daly's parking lot. And all of a sudden, there's four white males. <laughs> all of a sudden, there's four white males with a gun. It's like, who's the bad guy? You know. So it's one of those things. Like you know, we we really focus on the who, what, when, where, and and how do you do that? When do you do that? Like, do you do that? Do you hand that off to somebody else? And the whole point is, is to stimulate conversation with your family or your friends or that community that everybody wants to talk about. Like, how do we stimulate that? Because a lot of these people, y'all hang out with probably a lot of the same people all the time. You know, and you know, it's. A lot of it's being a hard target, but bad things happen to really good people all the time. So when that happens, do you have a process in place? So we, we do tourniquets and junctional hemorrhaging and airway manipulation and bandaging and uh, Kazavac and all these things. Um, you know, what do you do with your pistol? Like, are you going to drag somebody like in the old school Vietnam movies, you know, because that goes badly. There's, there's a lot of people that shoot people, you know, it's. There's things like that that I don't think people really think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've realized in myself that I'll go to the range. In my trip to the range, the uh, start time begins with a beep, right? So I'm, I'm yeah. going off the shot timer. And the way that the drill ends and I mentally turn off and start assessing, like, how did I do on that drill? Is I take my last shot. Mm -hmm. The gun goes in the holster and I'm immediately checking accuracy and yeah. shot time. And that's the only thing that I'm measuring. Yeah. When in reality, dude, if, okay, it, God forbid, I do actually have to pull a firearm in real right. life scenarios, I'm not necessarily checking accuracy or splits. That's when like, okay, unfortunately, there's a yeah. crap ton more work that has to happen. And <sighs> yeah, it's the vision. It, yeah, 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 what follows behind yeah. pulling triggers in real life? Yeah, like so much more than just what happens on a flat range. You're, you're hitting it on the head, you know, it's like, you know, everyone's so fast, even law enforcement or military, it's like, you know, boom, 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 holster up. How do we do? And it's like, you know, it's like you, the old school mentality was like, you should put your gun away without looking at your holster, right? It's like, well, when you're putting your gun away, it's because we don't need a gun anymore. So relatively speaking, it's, it's probably pretty, either help has arrived or, you know, backups arrived or, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like it, everyone's such in a hurry to check their work. And it's like, you know, what's your vision? Well, my favorite is the scanning, right? Like, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> you know, it's like, what are you looking for? Yeah. yeah. Like, 
like is that how you're gonna scan in real life like because that's not how that works like there's like a 360 degree world you know um and those are some of the things that we talk about you know with with the meta application piece because it's like you know how do you how, you know in a way you're becoming a leader on scene especially if you pull that firearm out like you just opened up a whole different can like you just put yourself in the arena big time and it may be necessary but you got to really think about like man like what look does what that look like yeah look what happened to kyle rittenhouse you can do everything right yeah yeah i mean it really opens it up i mean even like you know uh there's just a lot of examples and it's just you know how do you what's your process and i can't i ain't gonna be there when it happens to you probably you know i said before like steve wins famous little set he has a bunch but i love love arkansas steve but he'll tell you all the time he's like i don't know bud it's your gunfight like you know yeah. i can give you principles and guidelines and i can tell you kind of what you should be thinking about but the mission is going to dictate when you solve the med problem and when you're going to solve the tax problem the tactical problem and that's really what we teach i mean it's I think some people like think like, oh, maybe that's too advanced, or is this gonna be like some crazy tactic? I don't teach like needle, th you know, needle decompression, and we're teaching very basic life-saving skills. It's just in very high-stress situations. You know, we even like we're really big on the mental performance piece. Like, let's talk about stress mitigation. You know, let's talk about the residual or the, some of the effects, like cognitive, physical, social, and emotional, that occur during probably one of the most stressful times of your life. Yeah. You know, how do you breathe? Like, how do you talk? How do you see? Like, what do you, how do we do this stuff? Um, and I'm not the one that came up with all that. There's way smarter people that we, that, that we use for data on that. And that's where you see a, a breakdown. So that's what we try to do in the class. It's, I love the class. It's so much fun. You're going to get a lot, there's going to be a lot of blood, a lot of guts. Yeah. You're going to get to, you're going to get to really test out your, it's, I'll put it this way, at no point in time is there any gimmicks in the sense that we're going to, you know, just start hitting you in the head or like squirting blood on your hands to, you know, simulate how good your, your grip is. Like, it, it's very much, you're going to get, in, during the scenario or the evaluation portion, you're going to get what you get, and then we really have the freedom to really watch you and help guide you and let you kind of figure it out. That's awesome. Hmm. We're, we, you already know we're probably coming to the next I one. hope so. Yeah. I hope yeah. so. It's fun. Your challenge should be uh, to see what it takes to get me to kick in the vasovagal reaction and pass yeah. out. Yeah. 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 Maybe. I'm usually pretty good with it, but if uh, it's like stitches. It's like yeah. stitches get me, man. I don't well, know what it is, but I know this about myself. Yeah. So now, like the past couple times I've had, had stitches taken out or something like that, on the drive to the doctor, I'm listening to the heaviest darkest evil music i can listen to and i'm just like Whoa. just face push i'm in the zone take me to the doctor i'm raging i remember one time uh i was getting ready to get i had to get like a series of shots and it's not the pain like it doesn't yeah. none of this hurts it's just like the mental yeah i don't know how to explain it it's literally something going underneath my skin yeah. and i'm sitting here thinking like that needle is gonna bend when it hits my skin like it better hope i let it into my veins and that's how like I get into it. So we'll see if you can knock me out yeah. or not. Well, I will say like MPA. You know, if you bring out a catheter, I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe we'll do uh maybe we'll do some jug sticks or something like oh, that. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh yeah. No, like, usually as the MPA, people are really dead silent. Like, I'm gonna carry a nasal pharyngeal airway mm -hmm. because they get like this like oh we get to train on this like plastic dummy. I tell them straight up like you're gonna do that, then you're gonna do I'm gonna do it on you and you're gonna do it on me mm -hmm. because it's it's. It ain't rocket science. You either you're either gonna do it, or you're not gonna do it, and you're either gonna know how to do it, or you just not. You shouldn't be doing it at all. And uh, and I don't do that to like test anybody's gangster or anything like that. But I quickly find that it's one of those things people that have in their gear. They're like, "Why wow, don't somebody told me I should just have this?" Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. Well, cool. You bring up a really good point. <laughs> Where, so so okay. Here's a great example. Uh, you know, I have family friends that own guns. Yeah never train with them. They they probably couldn't find it if they needed it. It's certainly not loaded if they've ever even bought ammo, but they have a gun, right? right? They live out in the middle of nowhere and they have a little revolver. Um, I would never say you don't need that gun. Correct. But I know that it does them no good. Yeah. 
So on the, you can see where I'm going with this. On the yeah. medical side of things, like, do you see this a lot? Yeah, like it's these, a rabbit's foot, man. These, these elaborate, yeah. yeah. These elaborate like med kits with like you've got your burn dressing, you've got your your quick clot, you've got your you know your triangle bandage, like all this stuff. You've got your tourniquet, right? Yeah. Like which is actually kind of like that's simple. That's good, yeah. Chest seals, all this stuff. But what's the value in actually having that if you've never even like zero? So I'll put it this way: like there there was a. The mindset is like, well, if I can't use it, somebody else maybe will know how to use it. Yeah, I so way back in the day, that was my rationale too. And I remember coming up on a horrible, horrible yeah. wreck. I may have told you about this. Lady's uh -huh. head was swelling up and everything. And uh, I was like, it was me and this truck driver. He knew nothing. And then the third guy that rolls up was, a tra was like a trauma surgeon of yeah. all people shows up. And uh, I was like, I didn't know, I didn't see any lacerations yeah, on her, right. saw no cuts, just like her head is just like slowly growing. Yeah, a bigger hematoma. And I had this big backpack on, I didn't know it was like a sling pack yeah. with, with all of my stuff in it. But you look cool though. I did look cool. I look good. I look good. <laughs> it was coming back from Colorado. Do you um, have your eyeliner on too? My eyeliner? What eyeliner? Was this back in the day when you were, uh, never mind, you carry on. <laughs> Are you talking about my emo days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, this is beyond that. Oh, okay. Although okay. emo never dies. Um, he came up and I didn't know what to do. And I was just like, here's my bag. Do you need it? And he was like, do you have an IV in there? Do yeah. you have this in there? Yeah. Do you have that in there? I'm like, nope. And he was like, then we just got to sit and wait. Yep. Yeah, it, it's it's like my bag, my truck. I got thousands of dollars worth of stuff in there because I'm authorized to carry it. In a, and I'm in like an on-call kind of situation sometimes. Uh, but even then, like, like, like that, like I would think, I think people would be shocked at the amount, like, it's great to have, it's almost a rabbit's foot if you know how to use it and you have it. It's almost like you, you may never have to use it, which is great. You, you, trust me, you don't want to have to do that. But on the caveat to that, it's like, I understand some of the arguments that, uh, that people present to me is like, why well, live in an area where like, I know like my, you know, my EMS and fire is like not, they're not advanced life support or they're super underpaid. So they don't even have quick clock. Sure, that, that tells me that you've done the research and you understand the capabilities and resources within your system. Cool, like I get it. But you know, why don't you get some training too? Because if they don't have that resources to get to you, it's probably gonna take a while for them to get to you. So you're gonna be there basically like watching all this go down and you're gonna get told what to do over the phone, which sucks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I, I think it's, it's once again, like everybody wants to be able to do all this stuff, but like, where do I start? Who do I get trained with? You know, why do I need this training? You know, where do I carry it? And you know, uh, it, it's just stuff like that. And I think it's really difficult. Unfortunately, most people come that they get involved with law, uh, firearms or med because something bad happens to them. And then it's like, yeah, I need this. And then it's like, oh, it's kind of, too late now like the chances yeah. of that happening are so low and it's and already happened that. to you i hate hearing that especially like i've had i used to be a a, a firearms instructor uh, at a place up in nashville and yeah man you, that that was like a common thing like you'd get females coming in there and be like why are you getting your why do you want your concealed carry because i was robbed at gunpoint and you're like that's horrible life altering you know, and but then you're just like, well, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do with this gun once you get it? Like, well, I'm gonna carry my purse, and then it opens up to like, oh, we okay, well, let's talk about some things. <laughs> or I'm gonna keep it in my glove box, I'm like, you know, yeah. It, well, but it, it is, it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, I, I would assume that there are also scenarios where you could have like saline. I could give someone, man, I got my King Airways mm -hmm. with me. I got all yeah. this stuff. We're gonna go hike. We're gonna do a family hike. Yeah. Cool, man. You take in saline bags and like Correct. all this stuff with you, when in reality, kind of like the, the YouTube video that we filmed earlier today, yeah. man, maybe you should take some of that time and uh, educate yourself on the tools that you should have. Fantastic. Now, before you step off, can you articulate when you're going camping with a family and you're not going to have cell service? Can you articulate when you climb to the top of the hill? to get service, where are we? Yeah, what's your tinge of grid? What's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you even know before you leave, uh, okay, I'm going to a rural part of America. Well, great, what is the response time of those people? Yeah. Do, can life flight land there? Yeah. Even so far as 
maybe I get nerdy about it and I want to memorize nine lines. Like, can I actually call into someone and say, yeah, you actually can bring in a, hel a helicopter yeah. at this location as opposed to just, and people do it with guns too, man, I spent the money, I'm set. Hel helicopters are tricky because that's one of those things that ultimately like the system has control over. You know, I, I've never had somebody request a helicopter like if I'm going in route, but I will tell you like the, the average, like the, the guidelines for that is 100 by 100 square foot, you know, at, uh, at, at night. I think it's like 75 by 75 during the day and it can't be any more than a 30 degree in, uh, uh, incline. And then it has to be clear of like power lines and, and stuff like that. Um, but people, you know, is, they don't understand that. And then, um, you know, it's like you, you had that buzz saw. And like, I know, a lot, for me, I know a lot of guys, I, it's my goal to be on a scene and buzzsaw somebody in. Cause like, <laughs> it's so like, it's high speed. It's so ridiculous. I've buzzsawed helos in before overseas and pop smoke. And I love throwing smoke. It's, I think yeah. some of the coolest, I don't know why that is, but, um, yes, I would love to just be like, do you see my buzz? <laughs> you know, but, uh, but yeah, like that. What's your self-rescue plan? What's your immediate action plan? Like you're going out there like exactly like, so I'm gonna drop a king in an austere environment, like, you know, or super glock airway and what am I gonna drag you out of here? Like, do I have a litter? Right. Like, do I have oxygen? Do I have a BVM? I'm gonna just, just blow in this tube? Like, what are we doing here? You know what I'm saying? And, and that's, it's a failure to plan. It's, it, it, it gets down into the weeds with that and, um, yeah, it's tricky. You know, it's it's stuff like that that if people just took the time to plan that out, they'd be in a better spot. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a uh, this is actually a, an all American made cat tourniquet. Uh, don't buy the foreign knockoffs. Uh, get one from a fellow countryman like the guys over at Shooting Surplus. Our buddies uh, over there have been big supporters of us for a long time. You should hit up their website for all kinds of life-saving gear like tourniquets and uh, med kits and gauze and bandages. Uh, that's where we get a lot of our stuff from. And if you want to save some money, you can use the code Dirty Civilian for 5% off everything. Uh, we also have a newsletter sign up in the description of this video. Hit them up. Josh, you got anything to say about shooting surplus? Well, if you're gonna be buying one tourniquet, you should probably buy two because they are perishable. The Velcro does seem to collect extra parts and pieces. And uh, as you train with one, they always break down. Uh, as far as that discount code goes, it does save you 5%. Just remember when you spell out dirty civilian, it's a big D and a small C. Well, and that same topic applies with firearms as well. Everything that we're talking about, whether it's medical or I'm gonna go on a road trip or pulling a gun, like I can have all of my cool stuff at home. But man, if you don't understand like the basics, which seems like, I mean, there's that, there's that saying that everyone who's a professional, they've just mastered the basics. Like they know uh, the foundation of all of these topics and principles. Um, and we mentioned some of this in a YouTube video, but as far as medical goes, can you just restate where can someone who's like, I don't have time to go get my EMTB, but I at least want to know some of those foundation principles on a little bit beyond just tourniquet application, or maybe a little bit of CPR, where can someone go find some of that basic information? Yeah, so like, you know, um, social media is a kind of a dangerous world to get into, but like I, I'll post things all the time. It's like, these are the sources that I use that I trust, like that'll constantly put out like updated evidence-based medicine. Um, as far as like training goes, outside of like taking a, you know, American Heart Association or American Red Cross courses, because they do a bunch of different ones with like basic lifesaver. Uh, NAMT does like open to open enrollment wilderness classes and stuff like that. So if you're an individual that has to go out and you're just really into the outdoors, those are really good because it does talk about a lot of the uh, environmental injuries and muscle skeletal injuries. Some of the stuff that's maybe not life threatening, but it's difficult to self rescue or, you know, contingencies and stuff like that. Um, of course, you know, our course, uh, the med apps course that we do at bear. Um, and then, you know, the CPR and stuff that we talked about earlier, those are really big courses. And I'll be honest with you, like, it, it's really about how interested you want to. I, I always tell people too, like if you really want to see if you like this stuff, go be a volunteer fireman. 
to be a volunteer fireman, you have to go through an emergency medical responder course, uh, which is actually, I think it's, I would say it's easy because it's stuff that I take for granted, but I've taught that course and we have people that go through there and they can't pass registry either because they just didn't put enough time, effort or love into it or uh, it, it is kind of complicated because it goes through that whole thing. But that's not typically open to just the everyday individual. Um, so it, it's just kind of, you need to ask yourself, realistically, what am I going to use this stuff for? And, you know, kind of fitting it into your everyday day life. If you don't, if you're never going to be a hiking, cross country, overlanding person, you're going to stay within your little rule, or I'm sorry, like kind of city style living. Well, maybe, maybe you don't need to do that. Maybe you just need to do CPR and the trauma stuff. Um, if you're going to be very adventurous, yeah, I would definitely recommend doing stuff like that because I promise you at some point in time, it, do it long enough, you're going to find yourself splinting or dealing with a severe muscle skeletal injury or facial trauma or somebody falls off a ledge and bumps their head and what are you going to do when they get knocked out and you know, there's stuff like that that goes goes into that. Um, those are the big things. So on social media, a lot of people will try to prioritize, okay, well, I carry a gun and mm -hmm. I practice with it, I dry fire with it, I shoot a bunch. At what point, because everyone is always like, yeah, but you gotta make sure that you have medical training. Mm -hmm. At what point does the average person go, okay, well, I'm trying to stay current and relevant on some of these principles that's developing in the medical world. Is there a good enough for the mm -hmm. average civilian where it's like, man, I've, I don't want to say mastered, but I've accomplished a certain level of medical or, you know, uh, trauma training. Yeah. When can I go back to dry firing and shooting a couple times a week? Is there, is there a good enough for the average person? No, that's a good plan. I mean, it's, it's about like having expectations and standards, you know, like when we teach the course, we kind of give you some standards of like, if you have a target on you, you should be able to do this like within 60 seconds or less, you know, um, you know, we're, we're still going back to those timelines to the March algorithm to figure out like, that's what you use as a gauge to figure out how good you are. Can you get this stuff done that you need to get done, prioritize it, task it out, and then do it within that time, that realistic time period. Unfortunately, uh, like it's hard to do if you don't like have, if you don't know what you're doing, you can't rehearse it because then you're just kind of like, well, I'll just go watch like a, I'll go watch Grey's Anatomy or you know something like that. You know, it's like, so it, it, it is important to like kind of have that evaluation kind of piece to to get that confidence up, and then you know taking notes to figure out what those those guidelines are, those timelines. Um, yeah, I, I would say if you know how to put a target on and you're very comfortable with that piece of gear that you have, and you can. It's just like doing a, a mag, you know, just doing a reload, like touch points with a mag. Like it's the same thing, like touch points with a target. If I could, you know, be tossed a piece of medical equipment and make it work within that, that time period, then we're good. It's bandaging. Bandaging is one of those things that we'll teach and people will be like, okay. And then I'll have you do, I'll have you bandage the neck, the, the armpit and the groin. And you'll, you'll have people almost, they're like, like this is this is way this is really complicated you know and then you know we're, we're even just from the skill piece where we're not even having you cut clothing and then bandage and do all this stuff so it, it can be very complex it can be very overwhelming um just like anything in life sometimes that pace planning the primary alternate contingency emergency you can use that and try to figure out like where you're at and like what's my primary plan what's my alternate what's my contingency what's my emergency and if you feel comfortable in applying like your skills with that plan, then yeah, you're probably good to go. You're probably good to go. But the problem is, is it's just like anything else. Like if you don't put hands on it, then. It's not like riding a bike. No, no. Well, it's even like, you know, like I don't ride a bike anymore. Am I going to ride a bike? Cause I was really big into like mountain biking and BMXing. Same thing with skateboarding. I can ride a skateboard. I can't do an ollie or kick flip. Like, you know, I'm 35 years old. Right, you know what I'm saying? I know how to do it, but that skill is diminished because I stopped doing it. Um, it's the same thing with this stuff. Like, you know, you know, it just depends on how good you want to be at something. If your bare minimum with riding a skateboard is just kick push, well, I can do that. I ain't gonna, 
I'm not going to woo anybody. You know, somebody I'm down the street is like, do a kickflip. Oh, I ain't going to be able to do that. You know, I got to ride down the street, though. Uh, it's the same thing. Like, you know, if I could ask you, like, hey, you know, we just bandaged Drew's neck. I want you to bandage Drew's neck. How are you going to do that? And if you sit there like a deer in the headlights, or you don't even, you can't even visualize how you would do that through that rehearsal process, then you need to figure out how to get, you need to figure out who to talk to and who to get you in the right place. What do you, what do you think on social media, mm -hmm. you know, there's trends ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. For a while, the trend was all about like your EDC and then it was, mm -hmm. oh, which rifles are you going to carry? And, and every now and then we come across like, oh, you absolutely need medical mm -hmm. like, if you don't have all this stuff. But like, what about the social media medical trends do they get wrong? Like what is overlooked? What is falsely prioritized? It, it's like what leads up to it. It's like you're just teleported to this over the top scenario. You know, like I just engaged six people and now I'm gonna do med. Oh, you got an MCI. You need to call a hire. You need to do all, you need to triage, treat life threats and prep for transport. It's not, no, like, it, it's cool for looks or even like, you know, you. Uh, so I, for law enforcement, I use this, this pitch all the time with mindset, you know, you need to be hard to kill. And what I mean by that is like, I've done it before. We'll do like final exercises with teams and stuff. And I'm like, Hey, you were just shot. In the, arm. the first guy comes to the door. You were shot in the arm. What do they do? Boom, fall. And they're just, I'm like, what are you doing? You told me I was shot. So yeah, I told you you were shot in the arm. Oh yeah. Remember that whole self-assessment thing? Understanding it. Like we talk, one thing we do in our class, we talk about the physiology of death. And we break it down through different, like, you know, tires and switches, you know, me you know mechanical and, you know, all, all that. I won't give it away. But um, you need to understand the, physio the, phys the physiology on your end and on their end. Because there's a really important, you know, understanding of that competency that's going to fuel it. And I feel like sometimes it gets very, on the social media aspect, it's just, we want to show the fun, like the cool stuff. What happened? Like it's like assessments. My assessment doesn't begin when I touch you. It, it, I'm figuring out what's your nature of illnesses or mechanism of injury. If I go to a call, you know, I, uh, one that I just recently ran a few months ago that had a really positive outcome: uh, uh, bicycle versus a car. You know, I'm going with that call, and I'm thinking in my head like head injury, like 100. percent And she ended up having a head injury, and we ended up, you know, but I had a. I'm literally going to that call rehearsing like, cool, if it leads to this, if I, if we do a rapid sequence intubation and we have to put her on a vent, like this is the drug that I'm going to use. She probably weighs about this much weight. So it's going to probably be like this many MLs of drawing it up. Like if there's bleeding, that's the first thing we're going to go for, you know, like boom, 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 boom. You know, that right there, nobody ever talks about that. It's just like, or, you know, it's my favorite is like, there's a team of us and we're just boom all four of us dogpile on some way it's like and that's great but that's not like always the case you know so it's one of those things where sometimes we get a little ahead of ourselves and, and the process is really important and one of the things that i really cannot stress enough is the stress like how do you manage the stress and the visualization the verbalization the physical piece of that rehearsal i've said that like a hundred times i feel but if i can get people to unlock that like they do with pistol or like dry firing or you know even like you know you go shoot it you're going to the range you know you're, you're pr most people that are really good they'll tell you like i'm already thinking like yeah like so you know boom you know visualizing this whole process and you know knowing my you know the trigger pull and, and all this stuff and what's my vision going to be with this fast forward drill like yeah i'm going to get like an acceptable sight picture and then immediately go left or right you know those are the things that we're rehearsing before it's, it's just, it's just a, it's a rehearsal before we even get to the, the big game. And nobody ever talks about that. And I, and I, it's nobody's fault. It's just, it's not sexy. Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, you could sit up there and, and a person that does it very well is, is Seth Hasselhoen, who uh, is, you know, oh, yeah. yeah. <sighs> like that guy right there, he's going to tell you not what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. And it's a lot of it's like, hey, why do you suck at this? Because you're not rehearsing. Like you're not, you know, you're not doing what you need to do. And it's like, yeah, it's so true. People just, because it's not sexy. I feel really good at the end of the day on this course. I'm going to go home and I'm going to dump this. 
I'm not going to think about it for a while. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, it's fresh. Now you need to figure out like your rehearsal process. Yeah. So it's, it's stuff like that, uh, that I think, how do you even, how do you even do that without just doing like an essay? You know what I'm saying? Like, do, do you, do you have a video of somebody driving a car and be like, you know, dispatch, blah, blah, blah. You're responding to this. And it's like, okay, here's Paul's thoughts. Like, how do you do that? I don't know. It's just that that's part of the mentorship, I think. Yeah. But that is, I think, the number one thing. That and, you know, teaching things outside your scope of practice. If you can't tell me the, passive, the pathophysiology of attention to thorax, you have no business carrying a needle decompression. Or a needle for needle decompression. Zero business whatsoever. You're going to hurt somebody. Uh, it's the same thing with, like, carrying IVs. You know, like, you know, I got this IV back. Cool. Is it expired? Well, there's an expiration date? But yeah, dog, like... <laughs> <laughs> like, like, why would you, why would you start an IV? I don't know, man. Like, it just, I had this dude tell me one time that, like, it's good to have. Yeah. Like, he just throw that away. I remember asking someone after that experience, like, how do I get this? And they're just like, don't, like, don't, yeah. just don't. Because you knew there's so much to that, and uh, it, it's just it, it, the the fundamentals, just like we talked about. It's just, it's you're never too good for that. You're never too good for that. And when you think you're too good for that, then then maybe you need to go start a career in in a 911 as a as a first responder, because um, that you know that means that you're probably if you're if you're treating a lot of people as a like a civilian, like I don't know if you're like got a CB radio and you're just like sitting in your car waiting for things to go down, but like typically it doesn't happen a lot. So the warm and fuzzies that you're getting. Like, are you really testing, like you getting these real life experiences to, to evaluate yourself or are you, are you getting this in training? And, and I'll be honest with you, they, they can be very similar, but if you're not doing it every, like consistently in a job, well then you're probably not that comfortable in doing mm, it. Yeah. What would you say to your, so a lot of what we've been talking about is really catered towards normal dudes like us mm -hmm. who want to go out and get that kind of training. What would you say to people who are already EMTs, already medical professionals in their field. Um, what advice would you have for them? Because I know one of my earliest experiences with an EMT on, like, I don't know how I come across so many wrecks, but one of the wrecks I came across, she was one of the people who pulled mm -hmm. up and she had nothing on her whatsoever. She had no equipment, yeah. n like nothing. She was, she was there to lend a hand, but had nothing available to her. Yeah. And, or as I see you, you, you don't go anywhere without stuff on you pretty much. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, <laughs> like I do, like I'm a little paranoid, well, not paranoid, but like I, you know, I, I do carry stuff. Um, and, but I have used stuff. I tell people like, if you're a medical professional, man, you need to be very careful, right? You get fired. Like, are you authorized? to practice what you're practicing without permission. Oh, really? You know, well, it depends on where you work, you know, but then you go back into it. Like, so the way that the Good Samaritan Act is kind of written is like, you know, you're held to a level of licensure with the equipment that you have available. So like, if I roll up on a wreck and let's say you need to be intubated, but I don't have the equipment to intubate you. Um, I'm not really, you know, I'm just held to, I'm, I'm, I'm just like you. We're going to do basic airway manipulation until uh, an ALS ambulance gets there. Um, you You're know, not cutting a stick into an OPA yeah, to try we, to figure it out. We're not doing like the, if you've ever watched the old videos with like Crikey with keys, you know, you're like stick and twist and you're just like, I don't know who did that to who, but that is not, that's, that's, that's raunchy, man. But I don't know. It, it's you got to be careful what you know. I think a lot of people don't carry a lot of stuff just for the simple fact that they don't. The, the, the trauma aspect of what we're talking about is, is not really that common. It's a good thing. I've even seen it overseas. You'd be surprised at the amount of people that get shot or just penetrating trauma that don't need tourniquets. Seen it over here where it's like people get stabbed. You're like, how did you, like, you get stabbed in the neck and it misses every vessel. And you're just like... Well, cool. All right. Well, this is easy. Like, I guess we'll go take a trip to the hospital. You'll go see them. You know, it's, it's stuff like that. You'd be shocked. But when it does happen, it's, it's, it's very violent and it's very in your face. And if you don't have the equipment there, 
you're back to kind of square one and you're just back to literally just holding pressure. And that's a, that's a very helpless feeling, very helpless feeling. Drew asked a question that I found interesting offline. He was asking about tourniquets that are geared specifically towards mm -hmm. kids. Yeah. What's your thoughts on buying equipment that's like, well, it's not actually, you know, approved or rated for that kind of thing. But, yeah. But man, it, it works. I hear it works great for people of a certain size, either really big or really small. What, what about gear that's like, or let me put it a different way. Um, uh, I'm not going to carry a cat tourniquet because it's really big, but I am going to carry a different tourniquet that's smaller, mm -hmm. whatever the brand is, because, hey, at least I'm going to carry it. Like a rat's. Sure. Yeah. yeah something yeah. like that. Is there is there value in it? I don't like, know. Well, at least I have it. It it, it could, it's it's kind of like you know, can you kill someone with a high point? Yeah, I can kill someone with a high point. Is it gonna have malfunction? Like if I get in some like legit situations, I don't know. Is it gonna blow my face? I don't, I don't know. Um, like not so like my standard or my guideline when we teach is through like the committee on teacher will see trauma, and then in AMT. And all those are backed by evidence-based medicine. There's actually a study when we released the tourniquet video that we kind of referenced that uh, basically, um, and I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll send it to y'all and, and it'll, it'll kind of bring this to light. They took a study group and people with no medical knowledge basically, and they, they trained them on, I think, I think I'm pretty sure it was SWAT T, the soft T, the rats, and the cat. And basically did, they broke it down to uh, amount of blood loss uh, that occurred before they actually uh, placed the tourniquet on properly. Um, success rates with <laughs> applying the tourniquet properly, not being too complicated. Um, and they broke it down into little subdivisions. And like, if you look at the data on that with that study group, it, people that, it's the cat like is always, is always like, way above like 98 percent success rate 99 percent success rate wow and soft is usually right behind it so i tell people like just like i say in my classes my experience does not dictate why i teach what i teach it helps i can tell you some war stories but like a lot of these non-recommended products like are you are you putting like how like what's this like what stories we got here like what what non-biased evidence do we have that this stuff works and it can't just be like well i used it this one time okay well what, what was the details what was the mechanism of injury how much blood was lost you know how easy was it how hard was it where was it was it in your pocket was it in your car and there's a lot of things when you start getting into the evidence-based medicine factors that people are like well it just worked man and you're like okay or or i'll even put it this way this is, you know was the tourniquet even necessary because that's a, lot, a big part. And that, you know, we always tell people, if you think it's life-threatening, put a tourniquet on. You talk to these people that do these trauma studies or these trauma conferences, there's a lot of tourniquets put on people that don't need tourniquets. Did they die? No, they didn't die. There's no harm, no foul. But you can't be giving me numbers when, it, you know, <laughs> it's just like, well, we put 300 tourniquets on people this year. Well, only 20 of them needed them. But dang it, like, we got them on there. You know, it's just like, okay, what, what are we talking about? So, the, you know, that's where it comes into like certain approved, non approved stuff where, you know, I really try to, I'll be honest with you, we talked about resources. Dr. Andrew Fisher, I think his name is Trauma Daddy. He's one oh, of the, yeah. yeah. He, that guy right there, he actually FaceTimed me. I like DM'd him, like, hey, sir, uh, I'm a TAC medic prior Navy corpsman, and I have some questions about like pre hospital. You know what I'm saying? And like, he responded, he was like, yeah, I'll FaceTime you. And I was like, what? And I remember, dude, like he, he's- took, It's happening. Everyone's yeah, like, oh. I, I, no, I called my buddy and I was like, dude, you're not gonna believe this. Gotta Dr. Go Fisher haircut. is gonna FaceTime. He's like, what are you gonna ask him? I was like, well, we're, I'm gonna ask him about some blood product stuff and, and then kind of some of this like pressure point. I'm not gonna say crap, but crap. But he did, he took like 15, 20 minutes. I was like, before he went to surgery, like this dude's like in a physician's uh, like area like talking to me, you know, and I was like, whoa. And that dude puts out like, I mean, he is like one of the guys that are really putting out, you got an argument? Okay, well, here's the study and here's what we found. 
And by the way, I'm a trauma surgeon. They used to be in the 75th Ranger Battalion, like, you know, which is, if you don't know anything about military medicine, those are the guys that basically everybody gets their information from. So it's like stuff like that when it comes to trauma. And all that comes to us in the pre-hospital side, eventually. So it's like, it, it's not like I'm putting my faith in some weird, you know, committee that's holding all these rights and trying to, you know, it, it, it's really honestly doing the right thing and really trying to tell people like, you can use what you want to use. I'm just telling you the facts are over here, you know? So the kid thing is always a common question. And, and the, the compressible, the wrappable style banded or the tourniquets do work. They can work very well on kids because kids don't have the same density as we do. So the argument is honestly, is like, well, you could, I mean, technically you use an improvised tourniquet, it's going to work too. You know, it just depends and depends on the mechanism of injury, what happened. And there's so much stuff with that. Uh, but yeah, I am not a big fan of being a medical MacGyver. Like I would much rather be prepared versus having to go run. Like you look at Vegas, watch that video. You, you see a lot of guys running around with high and tight with no shirts on because they've been drinking at a country music festival. It's a bunch of Marines doing combat lifesaver stuff, using their shirts and making improvised tourniquets and all that. I go to a concert, I go to Nashville, the rare times I do, I have a tourniquet, my wife has a tourniquet. Like, it, you try to go through a security with a soft tee, they're like, what's this? It's a medical device. It looks like a weapon. Like, like, dog, you're in security. You don't know what a tourniquet is? I experienced the same thing <laughs> at Disney on my honeymoon. I, my wife had a cat in a cat yeah. tourniquet in her like in her like satchel yeah. her purse and he pulled it out and was was very much like what is this yeah. why do you have this and i i it actually it, caught me off guard because of how, how my wife had to pull me was. back because i was ready to be like you're telling me you're standing there with a security shirt on and telling me you don't you got a gun on you don't know what this is and she's like paul I was like, no, it's <laughs> <was> like, no, <laughs> let me, you know, and then they let me take it because I kind of explained it to them. Um, but yeah, I mean, like it, it's easier to bring something to the, to the game versus trying to make something. Mm -hmm. Under duress. And unfortunately, like blowout kits, like that's hard to kind of conceal, like unless you're wearing cargo pants or you got a wife that you can put in her, in her purse and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, it, I, I'm big on approved stuff. And there's so much, there's so much, there's so many selections of approved medical equipment by the, by either TECC or TCCC that. You still have options. You still have options. There's a, what's the, the new, the snake eater or the snake? Uh, snake, uh, staff. snake staff. That one, right? Like Dr. Fisher reviewed that one. And he was like, this looks great. We just don't know if it works. And. Yeah, what is that? Because like the committee hasn't convened to well, test the, it. A lot of the studies are done overseas. So like, you know, like, you know, we're getting data from combat, right? Um, or you have to get like a level one trauma facility that's associated with the university to agree to use stuff or to allow their EMS agencies to use it and do trials and stuff like that. So it's not like you can just... You know, that company couldn't just come to my department and be like, here's a box. I want you guys to like use these. I'm like, well, yeah, it's not like body armor that you can just shoot and be like, oh, yeah, stop the yeah, bullet. Yeah, it's yeah. you're taking a risk to test a new product. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it's not even, it, you know, the argument too is like, I'll get like a Doppler and I'll, you know, I'll, or I'll, you know, I'll go check my pedal pulse. And if it stops and it's working, well, maybe, and if depending on the mechanism of injury, you get somebody with a massive, you know, traumatic injury or amputation that's all spoiled up. Know, maybe I don't know like so it's really tricky you know I, I I try to steer people in the right direction but I also I'm I don't know everything I'm I'm open-minded so like I'm hoping that one of the that snake company put out because I have one it's cool it's a it's a heck of a lot slimmer and like anybody there's no you could it's smaller than your phone right. so like I, it'd be cool it'd be super cool if that worked I don't know about the little, the, be, the, the little crack of yeah, the chem light. Like, yeah, yeah. Installed. Dude, I thought I was like, what's a level doing? On That's this? what I thought. I was like, I was like, this has no, but I was like, I was like, okay, well. I sat down on that would be kind of cool. First time. Really? Yeah. I was like, oh, Batty. well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is cool. And, and it is cool to see that is completely different from people just ripping off like cat tourniquets. Uh -huh. Right. Yep. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, 
this stuff changes all the time. Uh, there, there's changes with all sorts of stuff from like the basic life support to the ALS style where, you know, if you, there's no reason, there's no, you can't get stagnant in that approved doctrine gets changed very frequently. Mm. So. Well, that's all I got. Drew, you have any questions? I mean, I could sit here and poke for stories and wild stuff all day long. Of course. But we got to wrap this up. Yeah. 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 Next, time, next time, we yeah. need some catheter stories and some more just like crazy, wild, hilarious. I'll tell you the STD swap story. That would be. Swap? The STD swab? <laughs> swab, yeah. <laughs> we'll do that offline. I'm already like picturing how it works. It was, I know. used to do it to, to new guys. <laughs> oh my gosh. Does it involve a Q-tip? It's a it's a steel brush. Oh my god. Okay, we're done. <laughs> we're ending there. Thank well it's not a steel brush, but you know. Oh but no, I appreciate y'all. Um thank you for inviting me. This is cool. I've never done one of these, so hopefully it was informative and not just, Absolutely. Just just ranting on forever. So appreciate it. I really do. Thank you all. Well, we appreciate it too. Thanks for spending the whole day with us at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's been and, fun. And uh yeah. Till till we meet again. Thanks. See you, man. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you for your time. Yeah. <laughs>